Hello and welcome back to another Craig and Dave Unscripted. Uh, it's just us again uh, this week. Um, obviously, continuing to promote the fact that we're going to be at BET in January 2022. So if you didn't see last week's video, please go check that out and see us at BET. Um, but this week, we're going to talk about how to get the most out of revision and what makes effective revision. Now, just before we dive in, Dave, people might be like... Um, Blimey, it's a bit early in the academic year to be talking about this, but hopefully all will become clear as we get into it as, uh, as to why we're talking about it early. So let's dive straight in, because as you know, Dave and I like to base everything on research. We, we, I think we tend to think we've got a lot of experience. We've been teaching for a long time. You were a teacher trainer, Dave. But I think as soon as you fall into the trap of thinking, you know that your way is the best, and there's nothing more you can learn is is the day you start making mistakes so i think you you you, you especially and me also we're very keen at everything we do is based on sound pedagogical research there's so much educational research out there we really shouldn't be reinventing the wheel should we no absolutely i think um neural and uh, cognitive science has got an awful lot to offer education and i think as long as you um also use this as an opportunity to reflect on your own classroom practice. Yeah. Don't just blindly follow what research says just because that's what research says. And I think sometimes schools do fall a little bit foul of that. I think what you have to do is take the research and think, right, how does this apply to my context? How can I make this work for me? And then adopt that scientific approach where you have an open mind, you uh, try some ideas, you reflect on the impact of those ideas. And if they've had a positive impact, then you take that forward. And for the things that maybe don't have a positive impact, then you reflect on, well, is it because of my implementation of that? Um, yeah. Is it because um, I haven't really fully understood what the research is saying? Or are there other contextual issues that perhaps the research you know, didn't really shine a light on that are also um, some things to consider. So I, I definitely think, you know, research has got a huge part to play. And most yeah. schools today do tend to um, base a lot of their initiatives on research, which is a good thing. But I think it's unfortunate that sometimes they do it very blindly without yeah. thinking about what the research was actually trying to say. Yeah, you're right, isn't it? it, it it's taking the best research that's out there and then thinking carefully about how you apply it to your local context, because every school is different, every class is different, and every student in that class is different. And I think as long as you marry those two and, and do it with a bit of thought, then you can, you can get a lot out of research. Um, I think the overall takeaway slide, um, takeaway point from this slide here, I mean, we've listed um, a bunch of uh, research there, but the, the overarching thing here is it's important that students aren't left to simply revise for themselves. You know, we need to prepare them. We need to teach them what works and what works well, which is ironic because I remember when I first started teaching and I think less and less schools are doing this these days, Dave, but the old idea was study leave. You know, you get to the end of the term, it's like, right, we're letting the year 11s and 13s go. Off you go, bye guys, off you go, study. See you at the exams. And I think in the last five or six years of my career, certainly my last school, it was like, no, it's not that we don't trust students it's that we're going to keep them in school till their exams because we know how to get the best out of them and they will do better if we're guiding their revision to this whole like this historic idea of study leave so i think i think there's probably still a lot, a lot of schools doing it but the research is quite clear isn't it you can't just take a 16 year old 15 year old 17 year old and say off you go see you in five six weeks your exams yeah, well, that student-teacher interaction has been proven to be, you know, the most effective way to learn, yeah. because otherwise, if it wasn't, then we'd be reflecting on the whole remote learning uh, that we've been doing through the pandemic and saying, do you know what, actually, that is the best way of learning, and therefore, let's abandon this idea of school buildings, and let's do all our learning online and remotely, but clearly... Whilst there is a place for that and, yeah. and it can have, you know, some, some impact, particularly if a student is able to um, engage with a lesson in their own time and in their own uh, way, it can certainly, um, you know, help in, in many ways. But it's been proven that, you know, the teacher-student interaction is, um, is better. Um, so, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Or oh, one of Hattie's top. Uh, I keep going about Hattie. I watched a little um, conference with him the other day, actually. First time I've actually seen him do anything live. But yes, te teacher led relationships, teacher student relationships, you know, teacher student interactions. It, it's one of the most effective ways of advancing understanding, learning, and achievement. Right. So here's the first one then. So when do you start with vision? Not you, Dave, because I know. <laughs> but yeah, so when do you start a vision? Oh, we, we leave it till after the Christmas, uh, the February half term, after Easter. And these are and these are probably all dates as well in, in my early years of teaching when I would start with vision. Oh, I left it too late. I'll do it a bit earlier. I haven't got through the content yet, so I'll do it later. Yeah, well, and there's um, something I was going to say a moment ago, and I, I kind of briefly forgot it was that, of course, a lot of uh, the things that we have to consider as well is parental perception. And there yeah. is a perception from parents that their child will learn best if they are given study leave and yeah. if they are left to learn by themselves. And whilst that may be true to a certain extent, I would argue, well, what research is the parent basing that on? Um, how is the parent perception better than the teacher perception, given that the teacher has spent a large amount of time with that student learning over many years? Um, or certainly the school has in the school context. So it, it's an interesting one that parents often think that, well, what was good for me is good for them. And actually, yeah. I don't think that's right. And I think as parents, and I'm a parent myself, we have a bias towards what we think is right and what we think uh, education should be like. And yeah. I think actually we we as professionals need to be challenging that and saying, you know, this is what the research actually says and this is what the classroom experience and the intent and impact actually says um, is, is effective. But yeah, when do you start revision? So, you know, we were, well, I was certainly trained that you teach the content when you get to the end of the course that's when you start doing revision and what does revision look like you know revision looked like handing out some past papers going through them in class and uh, you know giving students revision guides and saying there you go and we're going to talk about that um, in in a little bit but yeah revision was something you did at the end of the course now Craig and I have started thinking, why is that? And if it is at the mm. end of the course, what do you deem the end of the course? Is that when you've taught all the material or is that after Christmas of year 11 and year 13 or is it after the February half term? And why are we putting these artificial times on when revision should start? And this is what I was saying earlier about taking a step back and reflecting why is that the right time? You know, why do I finish my course on that date? What's special about that date? Is it simply because that's the date when you reach the end of the content? Yeah. So you start saying to yourself, well, why have I planned my course to finish on that particular date? And I think the very best teachers are continually reflecting on what's going on and why things are happening at certain times. And I think when you're an inexperienced teacher, you kind of just go with the flow and go with what everybody else is doing, go with what your school is doing, go with what your mentor told you was the thing to do. And I think as you grow into the profession, you've got to start not becoming antagonistic and becoming problematic and becoming that teacher that always seems to not want to follow the school <laughs> rules. No, I'm not talking yeah. about that. I'm talking about personal reflection on your own delivery and your interaction with the students. So after Christmas is, you know, pretty standard. After February half term is pretty standard. After Easter is like you say, send them off on study leave and it's kind of last ditch attempts. Um, but this is the classic, isn't it? This is the times when people decide that they should start revision. And I think what we're saying is that's completely wrong. Well, we do. And that leads me nicely on to when do Craig and Dave start revision? After the very first topic has been taught, not just at the end of the course. Now, if there were people there going, whoa, <laughs> that's lovely, guys. But where do you find the time? We'll, we'll, we'll get into discussing some of that. But yeah, effectively, this is, I think, the takeaway message before we get into you know, what makes effective revision is, you know, revision starts straight away after you've, after you've taught your first concepts. It's a continuing ongoing process i think that's the that's the big takeaway there um 
so that's that's nice. That's nice saying that. And I know we could we could probably discuss a lot here, but I think this will come out in the slides that come up. So we will we'll tackle and look at how we make that practical um, and, and, and why we say that's the case. But we'll just pop back to the research a second. We thought what might be useful here is to share with you a lot of the common revision techniques that, that you probably use. And we'll put them into kind of three broad categories. This is based on you know, solid research. So we end up with what's called effective revision techniques inefficient revision techniques and ineffective revision techniques. Um, now, it's not that if you're doing any in the bottom two categories, this is necessarily bad. And actually, some of them with little tweaks can be made a lot more effective. But this might be a bit of a real interesting eye opener. So we're going to take some time and talk through these. Now, we're going to make you go through the pain. We're going to go for the ineffective and inefficient ones first. But it's it's worth watching and not skipping ahead because, as I said, these might be techniques that you've been using for years. And indeed, I was using for years. Um, and actually, with a little tweak, some of these can be made effective revision. And then we'll, we'll end on, so based on everything, what, what what is actually really proven to be effective? So we're going to start off with ineffective revision. So these are effectively uh, the, the worst of the three categories. And the first one, reading work and textbooks. So you know, a little bit of explanatory text there and then we'll expand. You know, when a student simply reads or rereads their books or notes, it, it, this, this kind of concept, it creates an illusion of knowing when in fact many students show that they don't get anything out of this process. So do you want to expand on that one a little bit? Because that's such a common one, isn't it? Oh, we'll just go back to your textbook. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, so many studies uh, show that students get um, nothing really out of it. And I reflect on my own sort of childhood and my own experiences. Mm. And I remember my revision for GCSE. Um, I didn't really do much for A-level, uh, probably why I didn't do very well. Um, but for my GCSE, certainly, uh, I remember my parents saying, right, now is the time to revise. There's the table. Get your books yeah. out, revise. And I would sit at the table because I'd been told to do that by my parents. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest. And so I was reading through my um, exercise books. They weren't, they weren't written in a way that was um, helpful for revision. It was just a record of what I was doing in class. And uh, I had my textbooks, which I kind of just read and I got very, very bored and I would end up sort of doing silly things on my calculator instead of doing this revision that, um, you know, my parents said that I had to do. So in effect, um, I wasn't revising at all. Um, the truth, truth be known. And um, I didn't do that well in my GCSEs either, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but I kind of scraped by and I am where I am today. So that's, that's all okay. And I can, you know, I don't regret it in a sense, because I can reflect on it and talk to everybody else about it and hope that they, they do better than me. But yeah, real common misconception that if you just read your textbook, or if you read your exercise books, then you're going to somehow get something out of that and and you're just not it's it's almost not worth bothering with <laughs> yeah i say it's not that any of these techniques are are completely useless i mean obviously if you read your textbooks exercise books you know something extra will go in but it is the, the, the conclusion is it's ineffective that there are better things that the student could be doing and you could be directing and helping the student with. So if you're looking at it going, well, you can get something out of that. Yes, yes, of course they could, but it's it's ineffective. So here's a, here's a great one, using highlighter pens. Oh my, the amount of yellow and green highlighters. And then of course, I, I, I would be extra keen as a, a young kid, Dave. I'd go buy a pack of five different colored highlighters and we'll come up with a system uh, and um, so, yeah, I definitely am making the most out of it. No, it's on the whole generally ineffective. And it's surprising because it's one of those ones that we've probably all done. You know, highlighting does little to boost performance and it may actually hurt performance on a high level question that require inference making. So, I mean, and I remember what it's like. You'd start off being quite specific because students at that age don't tend to have the skills to know what to pull out specifically so you read a textbook and because it's written in a language which which seems 
a professional education to you at a child, child level, you start highlighting and you don't become selective. And I remember you highlight entire paragraphs of text and all you're doing now is just highlighting your notes. Um, that's the worst case scenario. You end up with a page of just total highlight. Well, that's all important. Um, on the whole, ineffective revision technique. Did you want to expand on that a bit? Just to say that as a teacher, I'm very guilty of being yeah. taken in by the pretty. So, yeah. um, you know, just moving to, to one side revision a second, when I collect pieces of work in and I'm marking them, if something kind of looks pretty and, uh, you know, it's been highlighted nicely and sort of underlined and maybe some of the text has been emboldened a little bit and the handwriting is very careful, you know, then I instantly think this is a good piece of work. And I fall foul of that all the time. And I have to stop myself and say, hang on, just because it looks pretty doesn't mean that it has substance and that it has worth. And, you know, these... Um, textbook providers, um, because they're trying to make their books, um, you know, appealing to a young audience, they are increasingly making them colourful and illustrative. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we all want to read something that is going to be appealing and is going to draw us in, is going to hold our attention. And so there is a, there is a place for that. But just because it looks pretty doesn't make it effective. And that's something to, to bear in yeah, mind. Very true. Uh, and then that leads us on to uh, revision guides. So uh, 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 just a, a word of caution here. It's not that revision guides aren't useful. You know, there are many out there. And, oh, blimey, the amount of money I've spent as a hod over the years buying packs of revision guides from various suppliers. So it's not that use useful. You know, they, they are essential, as we put on the screen there, for summarising what's been taught. You know, you have to look at your typical textbook for your course, and then your revision guide comes in like this. Well, excellent, a nice, neat summary of what's been taught. So for that, they serve a purpose. But without direction on when to use them, how to engage on them, they have little value. And how many times, Dave, be honest with me, have you done what I've done as a hod? I'll buy a pack of revision guides, I'll go look at them, the box turns up, Brilliant. Hey, class, here's your revision guides. Everyone got revision guides. Job done. Tick. I feel great as a hod. And then that's it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I'm always looking for the revision guide that looks the prettiest <laughs> and uh, seems to contain the most concise information, yeah. you know, that's that's well presented, because I think that's going to be the one that uh, my students are going to want to use. But absolutely, it was just one of those things that I religiously bought every single year, handed them out to the students and really didn't think twice about it. And yeah. it's interesting because at the end of the academic year, once exams are passed, you often have this book return day in schools where mm. students bring their textbooks back so you can hand them out to the uh, the next cohort. And I used to have quite a few textbooks come back uh, from some students where, because I bought those textbooks brand new, um, the, the spines were obviously new. And those textbooks would come back pretty much in a new state without a single crease in the spine. And um, then there were other students that would hand their textbooks textbooks back and they would be a bit crumpled and a bit worn and clearly lots of creases in the spine and they'd say oh sorry sir um you know it's 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 a little bit damaged and I'd much prefer that I'd much prefer to chuck that book away buy another book for the next cohort because it's it's not very nice actually for the next cohort to have books that aren't new you know so I used to quite often buy them new books um, but anyway they, they'd hand the books in because that was a school policy and um, they'd want to hand their revision guide back in some of them as well and you know lo and behold the spine on the revision guide um, <laughs> hadn't, hadn't <laughs> got even opened the there. page and so yeah it was quite evident I'd say to my students so did you find the revision guide useful yeah yeah what did you do with it I read it yeah but what else did you do with it well I, I just I just read it Oh, so you've took something that could have been really useful, the revision guide, and you've turned it into a completely ineffective revision technique because all you did was read it. Now, these revision guides today, they're getting better and better hmm. because they're starting to include now, you know, banks of exam style questions. And this is elevating them to, to another level. 
they're starting to highlight the command words um, in the questions and explain to students how to approach the questions and going through some exam techniques. So they're, they're infinitely better than they used to be. But I still think there's a problem because they will, might have a gap for the student to, to write in their answer and the student writes in their answer and they look at the mark scheme that's included with the book and they check their answer and everything. But they've now used that question. I mean, the most effective revision technique is going to be about having another go at that question another time. And we're going to talk about this in a minute. But you can't yeah. do that with a revision guide if it only has one copy of the question in it. So what you should really do, which is kind of possibly a little bit illegal, you should be photocopying the pages of that book so you can use them again and again and again and again. And again, you know, authors of revision guides, they don't really think about what is effective revision. They just think, well, you know, at the moment, it's all about command words. It's about highlighting. It's about exam technique. It's about making it pretty and colorful. All those things have a place, but it doesn't make it effective. Yeah. Okay. So they're ineffective. Let's move on to inefficient. So slightly different here, not necessarily as 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 bad as the uh, ineffective, but you know the, these can be very well as the word says these can be inefficient techniques, especially when done poorly. Uh, so making notes, I mean, this is a, a huge eye opener for many people. Maybe you know, effective summarizing requires extensive training. And that's why making notes is down as an inefficient vision technique. It has some impact for students that are skilled and know and have been trained and have practiced in making notes. And incidentally, this is why if you use a structured approach like Cornell note taking, which is one we suggest, this can then elevate itself to an efficient revision technique. But on the whole, just saying, off you go. Go make some notes. You know, there's the textbook, make some flashcards or take the revision guide and make some summarized notes. It's it's actually a the research shows it's a surprisingly inefficient method of revision without a real structured and trained way. And, and that's what we're coming back to a lot here, Dave, that you know a lot of these techniques are inefficient or ineffective um, without guidance for the student. And I've been guilty of this in the past, just saying, yeah, so here's some great techniques. You have that technique assembly on revision. Make some flashcards, do this, take notes, revise with friends. We'll get onto that in a minute. Um, and actually, without a bit of guidance and training and support, they become inefficient or worse, just simply ineffective. Yeah, there's lots I want to unpack here. Um, firstly, the mistake that schools make um, the leadership make in, in schools is they say, oh, our year 11s need to know how to study. They need to know how to revise. What are we going to do? I'll tell you what, there's a provider of revision techniques. They'll come into school. They'll spend a morning or a day with year 11 skilling them up on how to revise and be successful in their exams. Let's get them in. OK, so they get them in to the hall and yeah. year 11 sit and listen to them and they do a few interactive activities for the day. And, you know, they come away and everyone feels good because, you know, the student feels like, oh, yeah, OK, so now I have a better understanding of how to revise and putting together a revision timetable and, you know, an effective approach to my revision. The senior leaders think that's a good idea and they can tick their box and say, yep, yeah, we've done that. We've got year 11 ready. Um, and, and it's like, well, you spent one day trying to skill up young people on how to do effective revision. It, it, it's not good enough. Um, it will have some impact, but it's nowhere near as effective as planning for revision right from the start of year 10 all the way through. You can't just leave it to, you know, a day yeah. at the beginning of March where you get some company coming in and telling the students how to revise because that will have limited impact. It will have some impact, of course, but it will be limited because it's not something that you've done over time. So we'll, we'll come back to that um, in a minute. The other thing I want to unpack here is flashcards. 
Everyone yeah. thinks flashcards are a good idea. And actually, they are. OK, so when we're talking about making notes here, what, what we're saying is inefficient is if you, you know, just literally write out pages and pages of, of notes. That's that's very inefficient. It's better than reading them, but it's it's inefficient. Um, but flashcards where you've got that, those keywords and those those quick summaries, um, they they can be very, very useful. But there's a couple of gotchas with flashcards. The first is that you've got to make sure that you have covered all the definitions in your course. Because if you forget some, then there'll be some that you're not actually revising. So what are you using as your source material for knowing what the keywords are for that course? That's something to bear in mind. Then, of course, you have to capture a succinct definition of what those terms are. Where are you going to get those from? Because textbooks will be a little bit wordy. Revision guides will be OK. But how do you know that those are the definitions that exam boards are looking for? I mean, past papers are far better for that, um, I would suggest. And then you've got to use revision cards in a way that enables you to have lots of different decks and promote and relegate cards from the different decks so that you can focus your revision in particular areas, whether that's in a topic, whether it's in your weakest areas. But you need this idea of promoting and relegating cards in different divisions to make them really, really effective. And if your teachers don't tell you how to do that and how that works and what that should look like and how often you engage with these flashcards, then it's going to be really um, inefficient. You know, you'll get some merit out of it, but but not as much as you could. The other one is spider diagrams. Spider diagrams are great. You know, they're a great way of summarizing what you know um, and, and a more effective way of making notes. Um, you know, mind maps, spider diagrams, these kinds of things, they're, they're great. But what you should be doing as a student is challenging yourself to say, okay, um, I'm going to create a mind map of the registers of a processor, let's say. Okay, So you put in the middle of, of the page registers of the processor, and then you use your, um, your notes or other sources, your revision guides, your textbooks, whatever, to create the spines off that middle um, that middle term. Okay, so you might identify the program counter, the memory address register, the memory data register, the accumulator, the current instruction register. You know, and you've got all those on the on the spikes coming off the middle. And then, having done that, you then want to have your definition of each of those coming off that. Okay, and so each layer of your spider diagram gets increasingly more um, detailed, increasingly more connected with other things on that spider diagram. But that's not the trick. The trick then is to put it to one side and say to yourself um, later in the day, maybe the next day, I want to recreate that spider diagram exactly how I did it the first time. OK, and you do that blind. Then you compare the one that you did, which will not be as good as the one you prepared with notes. You compare them and you say, right, those are the bits that I haven't got. Those are the bits that I need to now try and remember and to get, get this uh, next time. In a couple of days' time, you then have another go at the same spider diagram. I'm going to recreate the spider diagram of the registers of the processor. Do it blind. Then compare it again. And if you keep doing that over time, not just once, don't make one spider diagram. That's not effective. Do it again and again and again, and you'll turn something that was quite inefficient, which is just making notes and making a spider diagram, creating some flashcards, and turning it into something that is far, far more effective. I've just got one final thing to say, Craig, which is oh. if you have got notes and if you are making notes because you like to do that and you think it works for you, um, irrespective of the research, then how could you make those notes better? Well, one thing that you can do with those is turn your notes into questions. So you write you write out, you know, the program counter holds the address of the next instruction. That's what it does. Okay, you've written it out. Turn that into a question, okay? What is the purpose of the program counter? That's your question. So for every note you make, turn it into a question and then use those questions for your revision. So you say to yourself in a couple of days later, you look at the questions and you say, hmm, what is the purpose of the program counter? Right. 
Um, it holds the address of the instruction. Then look at what you wrote, okay? Holds the next, ah, next, I forgot the word next. That is really important. So by using questions on your notes, you're going to make them so much better. Yeah, uh, which of course is one of the <coughs> key techniques of the, the Cornell note-taking method that, that we use when watching our videos. So ha, here's a cracker. <laughs> inefficient any of the efficient techniques which we're about to get onto with friends and the amount of times i again have sat in uh, revision halls and listened to revision assemblies and i themselves like oh yeah get a few friends over well we all know what it's like we're just as bad as adults you know many students like to get together with friends to study but what happens is the time is just used less efficiently you know, so even when using good techniques, you're better off doing it on your own. That's not to say every single minute of your vision should be done in complete isolation in a void. Um, but, you know, on the whole, the idea of getting together with friends to do revision just turns effective techniques into inefficient ones because you 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 go off topic and then and that's and that's and that's perfectly natural. But uh, it's right there in the research. I mean, did you I don't know, there's an awful lot to expand on that, to be honest, Dave. Did anything you want to say before we move on to Yeah, effective? well, I think given that you should be doing your revision in short bursts, taking mm. a break, not spending hours and hours and hours on this, but, you know, 20 minutes of revision, have a break, 20 minutes of revision, have a break, do something else, um, have a look at another subject, come back to computer science, 20 minutes, do another subject, come back, computer science. That That's far more effective. Um and there is, when we say with friends, of course, there is a place for your parents as well. Now, you could do what I'm about to suggest with your friends, but as Craig's already said, it won't take long before you're not talking about computer science and you're off talking about something else, whereas your parents will keep you much more focused, okay? So what you could do with your parents is you could give your parents your flashcards and you could say, okay, um, test me on these. Now, they don't need to have a knowledge of this subject at all. So they can read out the word that might say program counter. And then you have to relay back to them what the definition is. Okay, so holds the address of the next instruction. Excellent. Do the other one. Now, because you've got your revision cards in different decks and you're promoting and relegating them, then you can you know, make sure that your parents are focusing the revision in the right place by giving them the right deck. What they can then do, of course, is do it the other way around. And they could read out with no subject knowledge at all. They could read out what the definition is. And they could say, holds the, the, the address of the next instruction. And you say, program counter. All right. And as a result of that, then um, don't just immediately, you know, relegate the card just because you got it right once. Put it to the back of the deck. Go through your deck. When you've gone through your deck a couple of times and you feel kind of confident with some of these, then you can start relegating some of those cards um, to a different deck that's less important. And then you can bring some random cards in from other decks, maybe, into the, uh, into the deck that you're currently working on just to kind of interleave a little bit. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But there is a what I'm trying to say is there is a place for involving somebody else in your revision practices. It doesn't have to be done entirely alone, as Craig says. Mm -hmm. But you need to think about who is it that you're asking to engage in your revision. And if it's your best friend, I would suggest that's not a good idea. Right. Right. OK. So I was trying to move us on there. Is there anything more to say about this, Dave? And of course, Dave has something more to say. Um, quite a lot more to say. We've spent over half an hour talking about ineffective and efficient. We need to crack on. So here we go. So based on the research, what are the effective revision techniques? So we're going to look at three. Uh, the first is spaced practice. And this has been alluded to quite a bit already from some of the um, exemplification that Dave's been given. But attempting to retrieve knowledge frequently, we talked about the idea of coming back to the spider diagram again and again, doing the same practice question again and again. So it's doing whatever it is you're doing, doing the same practice, doing the same activity again and again over a long period of time. Just because you think you've learned something, don't put it to one side. And we've talked about this before. In fact, we did a whole video on it, I think, uh, about the forgetting curve. And very briefly, for those who don't know what the forgetting curve is, it's the idea of you learn something. And if you do nothing else with that knowledge, 
then over a period of time, you'll forget 90% of it. So if you just get taught everything in a course, by the time you come to the exam, most of that knowledge has been forgotten. Now, obviously, revision is designed to bring that knowledge back up into your mind, move it from you know short to medium to long term memory. But the idea of space practice, and this comes back to what we said at the very start, revision starts at the very beginning of the course. Some of your knowledge will be quite fresh because you've just been taught it in the summer of year 11. Some of that knowledge will be old. You were taught it in the first week of year 10. And it's coming back to this knowledge again at regular intervals, keeping refreshing the knowledge. And each time you do, you remember more and the forgetting curve becomes less steep. The knowledge loses its... Um, not not picking the right words now, but if you, you, you forget the material slower and slower. So that's what we mean by spaced practice. Um, did you want to exemplify anything I've said today? It, well, it, it's just to underline what we've already said. Yeah. If you if you leave revision to the end of the course, then it is ineffective. It's not completely useless, yeah. but it's nowhere near as effective as doing it all the way through the course. And um, space practice, uh, in order to sort of strengthen those neural connections, the research says you do need a little bit of a gap between what you've been taught and then going back over it again in order to sort of, um, you know, combat this forgetting curve uh, business. So, yeah, it, it's great to, to learn something um, and then not immediately test yourself on it because you've just learned it, as Craig yeah. said. OK, so you learn something, then start learning the next topic. And while you're learning the next topic, you can be revising the previous topic. And then when you get on to the third topic, you don't forget the first topic, still continue to revise the first topic and then include revision of the second topic. So what you're revising, the volume of material you're revising is also increasing gradually over time. And that's going to prevent you having an overload of information when you get to the end of the course, because you're not going back and looking at your notes and thinking, wow, I learned that all the way back in September of year 10. No, you learned it a couple of weeks ago because you've kept it up to speed all the way through the course. Now, it's not easy to achieve these. Um, you know, we've got some ideas that, that we'll talk about in, in future videos, but um, that's what you want to try and achieve if you can. Yeah, and I'll see also what happens to here. <clears throat> excuse me, all subjects, especially computer science, are very holistic in nature. And what I mean by that is, you know, all the various topics don't sit in isolation. They, 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 they overlap largely. So <clears throat> by building up this body of knowledge and you're on now topic four or five and, you know, you're revising four and three and two and one, you will start to make more and more cognitive links between the different areas of the specification because you know no area of computer science really lives in complete isolation and of course as you make those cognitive links and you're joining together the different you know bits of theory you've been doing in class you you, it, you become much better you you end up going well of course that works like that because that's based on that and based on that and and, and creating those links in your brain just means you'll hold on to that information even stronger so you know, it's about making those links. And you can, only, you can only do that if you revise the course in a holistic way. And spaced practice allows you to do that. If you take everything in complete isolation, you get thrown by the first exam question, which asks you to tie a couple of concepts together, which maybe you had seen as being quite disparate. Students often say to me, I just got one, one yeah. sort of thing, which kind of Go feeds on. into what we're about to talk oh, about anyway. Perfect. Um Students and sometimes teachers say to me, how do you know so much? How do you know so much about computer science? And um, my response to that is because I've been teaching it for over 20 years. What I mean by that is I've been teaching the same thing pretty much for 20 years. So Space of course practice. I can yeah. just, you know, tell you what the registers are in a processor because I come back to that every single September with a brand new cohort of students. And if I'm looking at it at GCSE and A-level, I'm coming back to it twice with two different cohorts all the time. And of course, because I'm going through this continual revision process with year 13 and year 11 at the same time as well. Actually, I'm talking about registers almost every week. So no wonder I can remember all this stuff. And then when there's something new to learn, 
that that is a tiny body of knowledge that I'm learning that's new on top of something that is so well consolidated over time that I can just literally pretty much do it in my sleep probably. So yeah, you've got to have this continual this continual retrieval of knowledge. Anyway, well, retrieval you, practice great. No, no, you might as well talk about this is perfectly done then. Well, you, you carry on. So this this idea of retrieval practice then, because this is another one of the effective techniques. You've you kind of talked about it already, but please carry on. Yeah, so with space practice, we're talking about not leaving things to the very end, and we're talking about revising, having a break, revising, having a break, and, and making sure there is a space between yeah. the learning of something and the revising of something, but that space isn't the entire length of the course, and that you know you keep coming back to the same things. Well, that feeds into this retrieval practice idea where you don't just read things, but challenge yourself to recall the content, you know? And um, th there's a good reason why a few moments ago when I was talking about spider diagrams and I said, you know, put the registers um, in the middle and then have the spokes coming off where you, uh, you name all the registers. And I made a point of naming every single register when I gave you that example, because mm -hmm. for my own mind, that is my retrieval practice. I am only content if I got all five out. OK, that I need for GCSE and I need a couple more for A-level as well. But, um, you know, I wasn't going to necessarily talk about the index register and the interrupt, interrupt register because <laughs> that would just be showing off. Right. But no, in, in, what, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that you need to uh, you need to continually retrieve this knowledge. This is what that's all about. And that's why flashcards are deemed to be so effective. But if you're using yeah. them passively, literally just by reading the card, going on to the next card, reading the card, going on to the next card, all you're doing is reading your notes, which is completely um, ineffective. So don't do that. You need to you need to retrieve this. It needs to be an active revision process. So teachers will often talk about passive and active revision. Okay, passive is where you're not doing anything new with the information, and it's very <laughs> ineffective. I wouldn't bother with it. Whereas active revision is where you take something and you do something with it. So creating the flashcards, creating the spider diagrams, but not just once, then engaging with them. Don't just answer the exam questions once. You need to keep answering them again and again and again and again. The same questions again and again. And that's how you're going to strengthen those neural connections and you're going to remember so much more over time. So um, yeah, you've just got to engage with the material, not, not just reading it. So this third one kind of based on um, what we've been saying already, but interleaving topics, which, of course, comes well if you're doing space practice and you're, you know, using retrieval practice. But, you know, recent research has shown mixing up topics that have been previously taught is three times more effective than blocking. So only looking at one topic at a time. So this idea of interleaving the different topics, and I talked about building these cognitive links and realizing that all the topics you're taught over the course of a two year study don't sit in isolation, that they all build on each other. And this topic feeds into this one and, and this one underpins how this one works. Um, and you know, interleaving topics just helps well the research shows up to three times more effective in helping you create those you know cognitive um links those uh, you know bridges between different disparate concepts that you've been taught um i really want to move on but is there anything else you wanted to say specifically <laughs> about that dave <laughs> well i just want to highlight the example that we've got on the slide so for example sure. you can revise arrays and you yeah. can revise static data structures and if you're doing decent revision you'll know an array is a static data structure but if you can sort yeah. of understand why that is by the interleaving of the topic so an array stores data in contiguous memory addresses and to do that, it then uses an index register to get the data back out of that array. And that's the reason why it's static, because you have to make sure that all the data is in contiguous memory. And if you don't do that, then your index register won't work. So by understanding it holistically, as Craig said, it starts to answer why things are the way they are. And if you just learn them by rote, that can be effective. You know, an array is a static data structure. But if you can ask why and you can answer why, then it helps to sort of strengthen that that uh, that knowledge. And as I was saying just briefly a moment ago, I was saying don't just do computer science, computer science, computer science, computer science. One way of interleaving topics is to do 
20 minutes of computer science, 20 minutes of maths, 20 minutes of English, 20 minutes of geography or whatever else it is and interleave the subjects as well yeah. as the actual topics within the subject. So yeah, if you're revising computer science, 20 minutes on systems architecture, followed by 20 minutes on data structures, let's say, followed by 20 minutes on something else and, uh, and just sort of you know, go between these topics regularly, um, not just in chronological order. Brilliant. Blimey. We thought it was going to be quite a quick video, this one. <laughs> We're not done, but I'm going to move us on. So I'm going to summarise this now, and I'm not going to allow Dave to talk about it. I'm going to summarise it into our six effective steps of success, and then touch on something which I think will be really important. And I will let Dave talk then. So as we said, how to prepare students for exams, redefine revision in your classroom. We, we don't need to talk about this more because that's what we've said from the very start. It's continual practice throughout the course, not something you do at the end. We haven't really talked about this one, but I think we're huge advocates of this. Do as much programming and studying of algorithms. This is obviously for computer science here as you can throughout the whole course. If it's like we leave programming to year 11 or, you know, no, as much programming, studying an algorithm for the very first lesson. And if you are a Craig and Dave user at GCSE, you'll know we promote programming in every lesson, give or take from the start of the year. <clears throat> lessons should address questions and not outcomes. And Dave's alluded to this a lot in <clears throat> what he said already. It, it, it's a follow on really to um, you know writing good questions and writing good flashcards and taking good notes, turning your notes into questions. In a similar way, a lesson should address a question. What question should your students be able to answer when they come out of this lesson, which they couldn't when they go in? Um, and that is, again, why all of the resources we produce have key questions built into the scheme of learning. By the end of this lesson, students better answer this question. Um, low stakes questioning. So this is pulling up on this retrieval practice, this space learning and also the interleaving. But, you know, the start of every single lesson, just doing some low stakes questioning on the previously taught material. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, that can be done as the kids are coming into the classroom. So it helps you settle the students. It helps you get over that. When do I actually start the lesson? Because people are arriving late. You know, it, it, it becomes a routine and it allows you to build in to your classroom right from the start of the year 10 or year 12, that idea of space practice and retrieval practice. We're going to be, you know, revisiting and doing low stakes questioning all the time. Keywords, so writing definitions. Don't simply display them on the wall. We all have these displays on the wall. I had these displays on my wall. I think we've probably still got one in the classroom. We teach it now, Dave. You know, keywords on the wall. But getting students to write down key definitions and then revisiting those key definitions over time. And finally, practicing exam questions with students and showing them how to answer them. Past papers is always going to be a, a key one that we can use as teachers to help students with exams, but showing them how to answer the questions, breaking down the mark scheme, exposing them to the mark scheme, showing them how the marks are applied will get much, much more out of it. Now, I'm going to wrap this up shortly, but if you've been watching all of this, and reading what we've put here and listening to our effective techniques, spaced practice, retrieval, interleave, and going, this is great, guys, but I don't have enough time to deliver the curriculum as it is. Um, then we have a solution for you. You know, you may be familiar with Smart Revise, you may be a user, you may have not have used it, but have watched um, some of our previous videos and unscripted on it. Now we're going to leave this till next week's video. The reason I'm putting this slide in here is I just want to highlight everything that Dave and I have done in designing Smart Revise has been based on overcoming problems. I am going to let Dave speak again because <laughs> I think this is really important, isn't it? I mean, we didn't just write another revision app. You know, we didn't just turn around and go, oh, let's just write another multiple choice 
quiz, uh, multiple choice quizzing tool. There's tons out there. We turn around and went, what are the problems we are having in our classrooms? Why are students struggling with revision? How do we overcome those problems? So we'll go into this in more detail next week, but each of our modes and smart device and everything we do is designed to support space practice, retrieval practice and interleaving. Um, so we're going to look at that in more detail next week, specifically how Smart Revise helps overcome and help with revision and all these effective techniques. So do you want to add some <laughs> summary notes on what I said there? I think I'll leave most of what I would say until yeah. the next episode, because I think what you said there, Craig, about what we do is we reflect on our outcomes in our classrooms and we say, yeah. OK, how could our students have done better what is it about what they're doing that makes them less effective and what can we do as teachers to make them more effective and as it's as a result of having those questions that we identified the problems or the barriers in our classroom to um, raising attainment and then we set about trying to break those barriers down. So I think next week we'll talk much more about uh, what those barriers were, how we broke them down, and the uh, impact that that is actually having um, uh, in, in our classrooms. So we'll talk about that next week. I just want to finish this episode by saying out of everything, you know, we started with you should base all this on the research, et cetera. Out of everything, what should you do? What's the one single takeaway from this entire video that you should do to sort of raise attainment and confidence in exams? And the research is very clear that the only thing that really you should do is to answer exam style questions again and again and again, and if you do that over time, you will significantly raise your attainment. The problem that you have is that the volume of material you've got to work with, i.e. the past paper questions, is quite small. So how do you overcome the problem of having a small question set to revise from again and again and again? Well, we'll talk about that again um, next week. But if you do nothing else, you should be engaging as much as you can with exam style questioning and then also on a sort of almost daily basis, some low stakes quizzing um, to keep things fresh in your mind. And the, a combination of those two things, low stakes quizzing and exam style questions are going to have a massive impact on attainment. Brilliant. Well, <clears throat> thank you, everyone. And well done if you've made it to the end. There's a lot to unpack when it comes to revision uh, and you know, blowing away some of those myths. But um, hopefully uh, you've enjoyed the session. Uh, join us again next week uh, where I say we're going to take a look at Smart Revise and specifically how it's addressing some of the problems we've highlighted in this video. So until next week, cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.